Hey, 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 it's Pastor Mike. Okay, it's not. It's Amber. But if it's been a while since you've listened to Pastor Mike on the Time of Grace podcast, it's time to check in. Pastor Mike is relevant and real and has more energy than anyone I know. So check out Time of Grace with Pastor Mike Novotny wherever you listen to podcasts. Today, we're continuing our March theme with the episode titled All Night March. Hey guys, it's Amber, wife, mother, warrior, type A child of God. Here at Little Things, we examine everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for joining me. I'm sure that you guys remember the story of the sun standing still from the book of Joshua, but just in case you don't, I'm going to give you a little refresher course because it's a very interesting account and it has a lot of lessons for us. So, and it's going to get to the point. So here we go. So first of all, it started with the Gibeonites approaching the Israelites. Now, Gibeon was a region just a little to the west of uh, Jericho and northwest of Ai. And the Gibeonites came to Joshua and they said, hey, we want to make a treaty with you. This was just during the time that the Israelites were conquering the land of Canaan. So they had already conquered Jericho. They had already conquered Ai, this little town. Um, There were some incidents there. Go to the book of Joshua to read about it if you've forgotten about it. Um, But they came, um, these people from Gibeon, and said, we came from a really faraway country We see what your God is doing and how you are, you know, devastating the people and taking the land. And we just want to make sure that we're good with you. So make a treaty with us. And Joshua said, hey, now not so fast because I, I, how can I be sure that you've come from this distant land? And they said, oh, we have proof. We're we're on top of this. So look at our sacks. They're worn out. Look at our cracked wine skins and look at our sandals and our clothes, which are all old. And look at our bread and our food, which is old and moldy. And they assured Joshua that all of this was new when they set out to find him. But it has been such a long journey that all these things are wore out. And we have this incredible verse in the middle of this that really shows us a key point here. Uh, And the, the verse is Joshua chapter 9, verse 14 which says the men of Israel, they sampled the provisions, so they looked them over, but they did not inquire of the Lord. So God was not fooled. He knew exactly where they were from. He knew what they were doing. Joshua and the men, the leaders, didn't take time to really ask God if they should make this treaty or not. So they made the treaty because they fell hook, line, and sinker for the Gibeonite deception. Well, three days pass, and they realize they have been duped. And so Joshua went to them and said, hey, not cool. Why would you do this? And they said, because we're not stupid. We see who you are. We know what your God is doing, and we don't want to get killed. So this is the deal. Joshua said, you guys are going to have to work for us. You will be our servants. They said, not a problem. Don't worry about it. We'll be happy to live um, as your servants. We just want to live. So Joshua said, well, you will never fail to be woodcutters and water carriers for the house of the Lord. Done deal. Not a problem. Well, except that the kings around Gibeon heard that the Gibeonites had made a treaty with Joshua and the Israelites, and they were not happy about this because Gibeon, we're told, was filled with warriors. They were mighty men. And so the other kings of Canaan said, not cool. You should be defending this land with us. How dare you turn your back on on us and, and make this treaty with these imposters who are coming to take over the land? So these five kings decided to attack Gibeon. Gibeon, in response, sends word to Joshua and the Israelites saying, help, we are, you know, in this treaty. You said you wouldn't destroy us. Now you need to come to our aid. So then we hear about Joshua and the Israelites going. So they get the news and they go on an all night march in order to get to Gibeon. Verse 9 of chapter 10 says, after an all-night march from Gilgal. Okay, so they get word, they muster the forces, 
and they take off. They didn't wait. They didn't sleep on it. They didn't try to decide if this was worthy of their efforts. They're like, no, this is, you know, we made this silly treaty, but we're going to, you know, own up to it. We're going to uphold our end of the deal. So they got right on it. They marched all night and then they attacked. And the attack was going incredibly well, in part because God was helping them. And and we're going to get to that in a minute. But so Joshua commanded that the sun not set. And we're told that God, for once, listened to a human in terms of Joshua was, you know, throwing out the commands and God decided to be okay with that command. He allowed the sun to stand still. So we're told that the sun delayed going down about a full day. Now, I don't know if that means a full 24 hours or about the whole full 12 hours that we usually get of sunlight when we're not in the mid of winter in the Midwest. So and anyway, at any rate, they've marched all night. They were fighting for the day. The sun started to set. Joshua commanded it not to set. So at least probably another 12 hours they fought. And then we're told the evening of the next day that Joshua found the kings that were alive that had gone in this cave and that they had, you know, barricaded themselves in hoping to be able to survive the Israelites. Well, Joshua found them and they killed them and blah, blah, blah. So the point being that they went a really long time without sleeping. And maybe we need to hear this. I know what I do, because sometimes we're under the silly, crazy idea that if we're doing the work of the Lord, things should go well, and it should be kind of easy and smooth, and it shouldn't be too hard, and it shouldn't take every ounce of strength that we have. But you know, that that's not what this shows. This account in the Bible is one of those that I need to go back to. I need to remember the all-night march. I need to remember that a lot of times because there are times in the Bible that God did deliver the people miraculously. I'm thinking about Hezekiah when the Assyrians were coming against him and they had been taunting him and they had been doing, you know, they had gone and told the people, don't listen to Hezekiah, don't think that your God is going to save you. We're so much stronger and you guys are weak and this isn't going to work. And, you know, overnight, God just took care of it. And I'm thinking about Gideon, who had 300 men and a couple jars and torches. And God just defeated the army. So there are times, and even in this occasion, too, with Joshua and the Israelites, God was working miracles here, too. He threw the enemies into confusion, and he hurled hailstones from the sky and killed them, which is incredible in and of itself. But the fact is, Joshua and the army, they were still fighting. They still had to march. They still had to show up. They They were fighting, and God was aiding them miraculously, too, but they still had to show up. And that's important because sometimes we get just a wee bit overwhelmed. And sometimes we think, you know, if I was really doing what God wanted me to do, I don't think this would be quite this hard. I don't think I'd have to fight so much to get this done because I'm fighting forces at home and I'm fighting forces in the church and I'm fighting forces in the community or, or what have you. Just remember, just because God tells you to do it or shows you to do it or because you're doing the work of the Lord doesn't mean it's going to be a cakewalk. Look at raising children to know the Lord. I mean, there are times that it is so remarkably easy. You sit down for family devotions. It's like everybody's into it. Their minds are open. You're having these great conversations. That is great. There are also so many nights when everybody's fighting right up until you start the devotion. When you read the devotion, it's from the book of Ezekiel and it's crazy and you're thinking, what? I don't even know what I'm reading. You're getting the commentaries. You're trying to, you know, flip through the pages. By then, everybody's bored and has lost interest. And you're trying to reassure everybody that, no, if God put it in the Bible, there's a reason for it. So you're digging through the commentary. You're trying to read the commentary. Everybody's like, mom, just let it go. I'm tired. I don't want to deal with this anymore. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Raising children to know the Lord, even just 
walking your own sanctified walk. It is not for the faint of heart. There are a million reasons to give up. And there's a million ways to get distracted. And there's a million ways that it is hard. That doesn't mean it's not worth showing up for. It is. We just have to keep going. So many times, people at church are doing so many good things that would be easy, and I mean easy, to give up on. Think of the people who play organ, the hours of practice they do behind the scenes, and we don't even know. I've been privy, I've been on worship committees and that type of thing, and I know all the craziness behind the scenes, you know, picking out the music, and then, you know, oh, two hours before you're supposed to do it, the soloist gets sick and can't sing, and so we're throwing together another song, and the organist hasn't practiced it before, and they're trying to rush. I mean, we see so little of what happens behind the scene, of of the work that's done behind the scenes to make that worship s- service happen. Look at VBS, something like VBS or Sunday School. I've been you know, honored and privileged to be able to work on those. But what goes on for the two hours when the kids are there each night is just a very small portion of the work that is done behind the scenes from the planning stage to the getting the crafts and the food and everything else ready and organizing the teachers and all that. I mean, what we see so many people of God doing is just a tiny smidgen of what they are going through behind the scenes. Even just having a sermon every week from your pastor, he may stand up there for 20 or 30 minutes, but he may be spending 20 or 30 hours in preparation. The communion setup, the banners, the prayer warriors. I do not want to forget the prayer warriors because those people don't get a lot of recognition. There are people behind the scenes that are praying all of us on week after week after week, day after day. They're praying for our families that we'd stay strong and stay together and walk in Christ and not give up. So many things, so many people being committed in order that the work of God doesn't stop. And that's why I'm saying to you, if you are feeling overwhelmed today, if you are feeling like, you know, this is just too much, this is too hard, there's, you know, it's sucking my soul, don't give up. The men and women of God, the heroes of faith have been doing this for a long time. Jeremiah, Daniel, Joseph, the Apostle Paul, I think of these people who kept going despite the opposition and despite the setbacks. Uh, Jeremiah is like my personal hero because when I read the book of Jeremiah, that guy didn't get a lot of fanfare. Every time he turned around, nobody was listening to him. Nobody cared what he had to say. He was the only one who knew what was going on because God was telling him, this is how it's going to be. And all the people kept saying, no, mm -mm, that's not how it's going to be. Nope, nope, Jeremiah, you're just crazy, and you're turning the people against us, and the Babylonians will never take this over, and you just need to sit down and be quiet and keep your ideas to yourself because there's no truth in them. And Jeremiah just kept doing what the Lord told him to do, even though it came with this immense opposition. Daniel, too, I mean, from the time he arrived in Babylon, and he had to fight for the uh chance to just eat what he wanted to eat, drink what he wanted to drink. He was constantly in opposition, him and his friends, you know, whether it was a a guy coming up, showing up at the door to execute him, or whether it was uh, Nebuchadnezzar saying, hey, you got to bow down to this idol, and I'm going, "Ah, no, I don't think I'm going to. Uh, Daniel saying to Nebuchadnezzar, look, this is what your dream is saying, and you should change. This isn't the way you should live, but Did Nebuchadnezzar listen? No, all the way to the end of Daniel's life when Daniel was still thrown in the lion's den when he was 80 years old or so, and when he was still going to now Nebuchadnezzar's grandson and explaining what the writing on the wall was. I mean, he was always up against people who believed totally different than he did. The Apostle Paul had so many setbacks, and he he even wrote them out for us. Like, who else has been shipwrecked and beaten and stoned and left for dead and <laughs> chased out of towns? And, you know, how many times has your life been on the line? And he never stopped because he knew that what he was doing was worth the effort. So that's where we're going now. What can we take away 
from this little talk, especially when we're feeling overwhelmed and we're really, we're totally ready to throw in the towel. You just have had enough. It's not easy and you don't know how to keep going. Well, first of all, we have to remember our strength is found in God. When you get to the end of your strength, don't worry. Don't be distraught. That's bound to happen because we're human and our strength does give out. The good news is we serve a God whose strength never gives out. And he has made it clear to us that when we go to him, we will get the strength that we need. So Psalm 92, love Psalm 92. It starts with saying, it is good to praise the Lord. That's the first thing. Sometimes that's the first thing you have to do. You're feeling down in the dumps. You're ready to give in. You're throwing in the towel. Get some praise music on. That works for me. It turns my heart and my mind and my spirit from earthly things to, ah, uh, yeah, I need to praise the Lord. He's worthy of my praise. It really does give me a lot of energy. But then in verse 12 of Psalm 92, it says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of God. They will still bear fruit in old age. I was just reading that today when I was feeling very weary. I got up this morning. I have a huge list of things to do. Didn't know how many of those things I actually wanted to do. And I I went to Psalm 92 this morning and I thought, okay, God, (laughs) you said that I'm going to flourish and I'm just going to count on you for the strength I need to get through the day. And, you know, I'm feeling some of this is due to old age, but you know what? You're telling me I can still bear fruit in old age. Um, So I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to put my faith in you. And boy, the Lord has been so faithful to come alongside of me. Psalm 73 verse 26 says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So true. Oh, we are going to get weary. Yep, we are going to want to give up. But God is our strength, and he's going to keep us going. In First Chronicles 16, and we're told, look to the Lord and his strength. So number one, when you're feeling like throwing in the towel, don't depend, don't rely on your strength, because I know your strength is a very, very short rope. If it's gone, no worries. You serve a good God, his strength isn't gone. Number two, do not forget to ask other people to join you in prayer. F.B. Meyer said, the greatest tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. If you are praying for strength, if you are praying for help getting something done, and you are just facing roadblock after roadblock, and it just seems like things aren't working out, first of all, make sure you understand that's probably a pretty good indication that what you're doing would really honor the Lord, because Satan is not really all that keen on letting things go smoothly. And I remember hearing this a long time ago. Uh, There was a conference, Christian people getting together and everything was going astray. And it just, one thing after another, after another, it just seemed like the wheels were falling off the cart. And uh, one of the people in charge of getting this conference together said, you know, we can be assured that this would glorify God because Satan is working really hard to not let this happen. I've never forgotten that. So first of all, if if you're facing a ton of roadblocks and things just aren't going together, know that there's a good chance you're doing something worthwhile. But two, when that happens, that's a good time to reach out to your friends. Send that text to your good Christian friends, the ones who stand beside you, the ones who encourage you during ministry and say, hey, um, so this is the situation. I'm feeling overwhelmed because I'm trying to get this done. And every time I turn around, something else is going wrong. Could you pray? Could you just spend a little bit of time praying that God would really help me to get through this and that all these roadblocks would be overcome and that we could do this um, so that we can teach the children or play the music or honor God or worship God or glorify God or whatever it is? And time after time, when I have been fighting something on my own and just don't seem to have any answer to my prayers, um, you know, when I call a friend or two and just say, hey, I'm struggling here, I could, I could use somebody else praying with me, almost 
always, that's when I have seen the breakthroughs. I'm not saying that there isn't any anything to prayer on your own. We're told in the book of James that the prayer of one man can make such a difference. Absolutely true. But there are times that I have reached out to my friends and that's when things have gone on. So don't forget and don't neglect to ask the people of God for prayer and to pray with you. The Apostle Paul did. You know, we look at the Apostle Paul as this huge doer, right? He not only went and started all these churches and taught them how to keep running, he wrote these letters that we're still learning from today. But in his his letters, he says, pray for me too. He had people praying for him. He had people behind him helping pray through the bra- the things that were that might have otherwise shut him down. So don't neglect that. And number three, keep your eye on the goal. If Joshua and the Israelites at any point in that whatever, 48, 60, 72, I don't know how many hours that they were awake, at any point if they would have just like had a little powwow and said, um, yeah, I'm really tired. I, I don't know that I want to go on. Um, are you guys tired? You guys, I mean, there's, they could have shut the whole operation down. I'm assuming that they were just dead set on what they had to do, and they just kept looking forward, which is what we're told to do in the book of Philippians. The Apostle Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Don't get distracted. And when you start seeing all the things falling apart, it is so easy to fall into this litany of complaints. I've been there a million times, right? You, you got to choose what you're going to do. So you can sit and pout and you can complain and you can just start getting distress, distracted and giving up or you can keep your eye on the prize. So what do you have to do to get there? So I'm feeling weary. Maybe you need a 10 minute power nap. That has been a godsend to me on so many occasions. There have even been times that I've driven to work and sat outside, set my phone alarm for 10 minutes, slept for 10 minutes, shut my eyes for 10 minutes, gone in just fine, or come out for break, do the same. Um, maybe you need a power nap. Maybe you need to reach out to some friends and ask them to pray you through. Um, maybe you just need to keep your eyes on on what needs to get done. And that very, very long list, which seems like it might overwhelm you, I've always said, if you look at this long list and it's overwhelming, just look at the first thing on the list. Break it up into doable size pieces. Do one thing and then do the next thing, but keep your eye on the price. Keep your eye on the end goal. Make sure that you're not allowing Satan or your own personality to just stuff you down and say, you know, you're you're never going to accomplish this. This is never going to get done. Why are you even trying? Why do you keep going? Why do you keep working on this or working towards this? This clearly is more than you can do. Well, one thing at a time and maybe call in help. Not just, you know, if, if it's truly overwhelming and if this is more than you can do and if you're trying to do something big in the kingdom of God or, or VBS or Sunday school or Christmas program or whatever it is that you're trying to do, maybe you do need a couple extra hands. It's not a bad thing. If nothing else, they can be there to encourage you, support you, help you, keep you going forward. All these things are just to say that if you are in the middle of something and you're feeling like it's not going to work out, just remember to keep marching. Keep your eyes on the prize. Get your strength from the Lord and don't neglect your friends who will pray you through. This has been Little Things because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things. Thanks for listening again this week. And don't forget, we're here for you. Check out the many resources we have to help you on your faith journey. Just go to timeofgrace.org to sign up for our daily email that will keep you in the loop with all that we have available.